I'm Elizabeth Slattery, and welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. This week, I'm joined by John Carlo Canaparo and Amy Swear, and we're talking about the court's historic telephone oral arguments, the toilet flush heard around the world, and recent opinions. And I also chatted with Jim and Allison Ho. So Monday of this week was a historic event, the, the first time in history that the Supreme Court has conducted oral argument by telephone. And each lawyer had a few minutes to give an opening, and then the justices asked questions in order of seniority. Uh, it was a pretty orderly approach. Appellate Twitter went wild when Justice Clarence Thomas asked questions, since he's famously quiet during traditional oral arguments. Uh, and the Chief Justice uh, played traffic cop, as he does in a regular oral argument. But he let each of his colleagues ask questions for a few minutes at a time before moving it on to the next uh, so this meant that certain justices, I won't uh, say any particular names, but certain justices didn't dominate argument the way we sometimes see. Um, I will say, I, I thought overall it went pretty well, about as well as it could have gone, uh, but it was a little bit less conversational than a typical oral argument at the Supreme Court. Um, I also think it's a little too soon to tell if this will have a broader impact on the court's uh, approach to oral argument and uh, when it returns for in-person arguments. And it certainly doesn't have any bearing on the effort, the ongoing effort to bring cameras into the courtroom, uh, which is something I think nearly all of the justices have said they strongly oppose. So guys, guys what, do you, what do you think? I had a question for you on that, Elizabeth. Do you think that when we return to in-person oral arguments, the court will continue to uh, have an audio feed? It's a good question. I mean, the court has resisted efforts for live uh, live audio of its arguments, even though it has the capability to do it. They pipe the the sound into the lawyers' lounge at the Supreme Court already, and they, you know, sometimes I think uh, in about twenty eight or or so cases, they've issued same day audio, not not a, a live feed uh, until, of course, this week. So. The court may decide after this experiment that it will proceed with with live audio. Uh, but I, I think the the arguments this week and the ones coming up next week, this is a good um, experiment for the court. Uh, and, and they'll have to see the justices will have to see if they're comfortable with making that a permanent change going forward. Yeah, well, I think we've already seen, as Elizabeth pointed out, at least one way in which telephonic arguments have noticeably changed the dynamic of the court. And that's in Justice Thomas asking questions. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Justice Thomas, for those of you who don't know, is, is notorious for not asking questions during oral argument. He and he goes years. I think at one one point he went an entire decade uh, without asking a single question. And, and this week, in a shock to many listeners, uh, Thomas asked not not one, not two, not three, but a lot of questions uh, and questions. I think um, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think he has asked questions in every argument thus far. And I think it's worth pointing out that Carrie Severino of the Judicial Crisis Network actually called this uh, last week and she was spot on. Um, so she uh, reasoned on Twitter that uh, there, there might be a chance that sort of this more organized system uh, of telephonic arguments meant that uh, Justice Thomas wouldn't think that the oxygen in the room was being taken up in the way uh, that he normally does and that it would be more conducive to him asking questions. So I think it's worth a you know, shout out to her. Um, she nailed this. She was spot on in, in calling this last week. Well, Carrie certainly knows what she's talking about. She, of course, clerked for Justice Thomas. And, you know, he's explained in interviews in the past why he doesn't tend to ask questions very often in oral argument. And it's because he said that he thinks the justices should be listening more. And uh, he thinks that sometimes they get a bit rude and he wants to actually hear what the advocates have to say about their cases. It definitely was a much more collegial atmosphere. But one thing I noticed was that the chief uh, oral arguments ran longer than usual. It looked like to me that the chief didn't have the ability to control the timing as well as usual. Did you notice the same thing, Elizabeth? Yeah, I didn't look at the the runtime for all of the arguments, but I know the first one was something like 77 minutes. So that was an additional 17 minutes over a, a typical hour long argument. And that that could have been because he was 
you know, trying to allow each of his colleagues to ask a few minutes of questions and then let the let the attorneys have the opportunity to respond without uh, cutting cutting people off too often and to get all the way through the roster of all nine justices, uh, you know, in, in some instances twice in other instances, if there's, you know, divided argument more, more than uh, more than two times. Mm-hmm. Another thing I, I think is really worth talking about uh, in, in the court this week was that earlier this week, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was back in the news. Uh, it was announced that she had been hospitalized for a gallstone that ultimately caused an infection. She is reportedly doing well, which is good. Uh, I I think she has since been discharged. And she did conduct oral arguments on Wednesday from her hospital bed, which is amazing. Um, But but I also don't think anybody should be really surprised by the toughness of the notorious RBG. So can we just take a minute to discuss how many times Ruth Bader Ginsburg has kicked cancer's butt. Uh, So in this rundown, this starts in 1999. She gets diagnosed with colon cancer. Guess what? Beats it. Beats it. That's right. Not only beats it, starts working out with a personal trainer. She can reportedly do more push-ups than two-thirds of Americans. Yep, yep, probably (laughs) including myself at, at this point. Ten years later... Fast forward to 2009, she finds out she has pancreatic cancer. Guess what, John Carlo? Beats it again. Beats it again, is back on the bench within weeks of surgery. Fast forward five more years, 2014. Guess what? Cancer? Not cancer, but she does have a stent placed in her right coronary artery, and she keeps doing (laughs) push-ups. Get those gains. Getting those gains. That's right. 2018. She falls, breaks some ribs. Guess what they find in her lungs? Cancer? Cancer number three. Cancerous nodules in her lungs. And she says, you know what? Just cut off that part of my lung. It's fine. Uh, Cuts out that that part of her lung. Bye-bye cancer number three. And let me guess. She's still doing push-ups. Still doing (laughs) push-ups. Fast forward to just last year, 2019, cancer number four, tumor on her pancreas, doesn't even bother telling anyone until after treatment. That's RBG4, cancer none. Yes, for those of you keeping score at home, that is a big goose egg for cancer. Um, So uh, certainly we we wish uh, Justice Ginsburg the very best in a, in a speedy recovery. I've not had gallstones, but I can't imagine that that they are pleasant. Um, and it is good to see uh, that she was back and, and feisty as ever in, in oral arguments. So uh, best of luck and speedy recovery to her. It was definitely peak uh, notorious RBG to not only participate in oral argument from her hospital bed, but also that she had one of the opinions we're going to talk about later uh, that came out this week, which she presumably put the finishing touches on when she was in in the hospital. Nothing slows her down. Not at all. A big week for Supreme Court news, but perhaps the biggest bit of news, Flushgate. Uh, During Roman Martinez's oral argument in the robocall case, while uh, he was answering questions from Justice Kagan, there was, in the background, the distinct sound of a toilet flushing. No one knows, no one has fessed up, uh, but... There it was in the middle of Supreme Court oral argument. Yeah, this was a very, very audible toilet flush. Um, No one has fessed up. There are some theories circulating on the interwebs. I will not throw anyone under the bus, so I won't (laughs) won't get into that. But there are some theories out there. Um, And I I love that this is already being called Flushgate. Um, And it's frankly, I think, good to see for a lot of people that these are still... Uh, regular people working from home during quarantine, just like the rest of us, failing to mute things during conference calls like the rest of us. You know, it's not the most embarrassing telework story I've heard since we've all been quarantined. But it, what it what is sort of, despite the fact that it was a shocking and, and funny and I guess an embarrassing moment, it sort of underscored for me actually how seamless telephonic oral arguments went besides Flushgate. Uh, with with a few little accidental mutes here and there, 
it was a very smooth process considering how many people and how many moving parts had to be uh, put in order for this to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. And again, I think Elizabeth sort of hinted at this. I, I think at one point, Justice Breyer may have gotten kicked from the line. And then at another point uh, during oral arguments on on Wednesday, it sounded like Justice Thomas may have accidentally muted himself. But but other than that, this has been very seamless. And I'm actually quite impressed by, by how, um, frankly, a bunch of boomers. Uh, boomers have uh, done really well with this at the court, um, making this go fairly uh, smoothly. So just one uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is that the fact that the toilet flush is probably the biggest news from the arguments this week may not bode well for the future of live audio at the court. <laughs> um, I, I have a feeling that the uh, the court, which is very averse to change and to adopt any new technology, may not love that uh, this is the most press that they're getting is that there was a toilet flushing during oral <laughs> argument. Well, besides all of that news, uh, on to more serious things. We did have two opinions this week, both unanimous. Uh, we had an opinion in the Bridgegate case. And in this year's Ninth Circuit, what are you doing? Please stop. A unanimous opinion uh, in a criminal case. Amy, why don't you tell us about Bridgegate? Yeah, so this first opinion released this week was in Kelly v. United States, which, if you recall, stemmed from the infamous Bridgegate scandal. In 2013, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie was running for re-election, and he was pretty upset with a particular mayor who uh, apparently refused to endorse him. So Governor Christie's chief of staff, Bridget Ann Kelly, allegedly came up with an idea to get back at the mayor by realigning lanes on a busy toll road uh, under the guise of conducting a traffic study. This, of course, caused horrible, horrible gridlock in the mayor's city for several days. Eventually, the Port Authority figured out what was going on. The lanes were changed back. Uh, and Kelly and some others ended up not just getting grilled uh, in the media, but were actually charged and convicted of federal wire fraud crimes for their roles in this. So the government's argument was essentially that uh, this realignment of the lanes wasn't a legitimate use of their authority because it was really just a political ruse. And therefore, they had actually defrauded the government of all of the time and labor spent pulling it off, including actually their own time and labor as government employees. And Kelly uh, and her other defendants argued that you can't convict public officials for simply exercising their lawful regulatory powers in a way that you think is, is deceptive or lowbrow. The Supreme Court this week, in a unanimous opinion by Justice Kagan, agreed with Kelly, effectively tossing their criminal convictions. So the court reasoned that not every corrupt act by state or local officials is a federal crime. Uh, so while the court didn't uh, clearly condone what had happened, they looked at this and said, even though these retaliatory lane changes amounted to official wrongdoing and were probably a deceptive abuse of power, they didn't constitute fraud under the federal statute. Because you can't say that altering a regulation you have the power to alter appropriates government money or property. Um, so the, the object, the purpose of this alleged fraud was political payback and, and retaliation, not getting the government's money or property. Um, so in short, under the statute, uh, these actions may have been morally wrong. They may have been corrupt in a general sense, but they simply weren't criminal. So Amy, this, it seems to me like this was bad behavior. So do they just get a pass? What is, or does a prosecutor bring, did the prosecutor make a mistake and pick the wrong charge? Do they just get a pass? What happens here? So I think the argument here is that, again, while this may have been wrong, um, it wasn't a crime. There, there were certainly uh, democratic um, repercussions. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in the electorate looked at this and said, yeah, this is really bad. This was not a good, wise, smart prudent use of government resources, um, it, but it, it's simply not a crime. And one of the arguments sort of underlying all of this was that we don't want to second guess public officials and then turn everything, you know, that, that may have had, you know, facially legitimate 
purpose into, well, can we find a reason to criminally convict public officials for 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 policies that that you know maybe a majority of people found to be a waste of time and resources or or may have had an underlying you know sort of political purpose because that just opens up the door um, for trying to convict a lot of public officials and so they're not necessarily off the hook um, in a broad sense uh, but uh, they they can't be charged with a crime here well you know I think that chanting lock them up is an American tradition that the Supreme Court has interfered with, quite frankly. I would, I would love to see your case <laughs> citation for that. <laughs> Elizabeth, there was one more case uh, issue today, United States versus Sinanang Smith. Can you tell us about that one? Yes. Yeah, so this was uh, another unanimous opinion, this one by Justice uh, Ginsburg from her hospital bed. So the case involves Evelyn Sinanang Smith who operated an immigration consulting firm in California. She would enter into retainer agreements with individuals who were uh, illegally present in the country and offer to file documents with the government that would allow them to adjust their status. Uh, So she knew her clients wouldn't qualify for an adjustment of status, but she still filed the documents um, in the process causing these individuals to remain in the country. So Sinanang Smith was subsequently convicted Uh, on two counts of violating a federal law that prohibits encouraging or inducing an alien to come, enter, or reside in the United States, knowing or in reckless disregard of the fact that such coming to entry or residence is or will be in violation of the law. So there's also an enhancement uh, applied if an individual committed the crime for the purpose of commercial advantage or private financial gain. So Sinanang Smith argued that this statute violated Uh, both the free speech and petition clauses of the First Amendment as applied to her. The district court rejected these claims, and on appeal at the Ninth Circuit, that court asked for supplemental briefing on three issues, and it appointed amiki, uh, who, you know, are friends of the court, uh, and including uh, on the issue of whether the statute was overbroad under the First Amendment. So then, in accordance with the amiki's arguments, the Ninth Circuit held that the law was overbroad and invalidated it. The Supreme Court vacated that ruling, holding that the Ninth Circuit committed a drastic departure from the well-established party presentation rule when it named three amici and invited them to brief and argue issues framed by that court instead of by the parties. Uh, The court remanded the case for reconsideration by the Ninth Circuit in light of uh, arguments actually advanced by the parties instead of those framed by the court and its amici. So Justice Thomas concurred mentioning that he has doubts about the court's overbreath doctrine. He said that this doctrine appears to lack any basis in the Constitution's text, uh, violates the usual standard for facial challenges, and contravenes traditional standing principles. So he says he would therefore consider revisiting this doctrine in an appropriate case. Uh, And one final thing I want to point out is that the court uh, added an addendum to its opinion, pointing out that it has, on occasion, requested supplemental briefing in cases, uh, but this is typically limited to whether the court has jurisdiction over uh, over the matter or if there are constitutional issues that are implicated but not directly raised in the cert petition. Every single term, it, it feels like there there's one of these unanimous, less than Ninth Circuit. You just can't. You can't do that. Um, so it's. I think we've gotten this year's iteration of that out of the way. Well, the Ninth Circuit judges certainly get points for creativity. I'll give them that. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely a lot of creativity happening in, in the Ninth Circuit in, in recent decades. Well, next up, I recently spoke with Texas power couple Jim and Allison Ho. I'm pleased to have Jim and Allison Ho join me today. Jim is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and Allison is the co-chair of Gibson Dunn's appellate practice. Welcome to SCOTUS 101. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So first off, how are you all doing? Even before the pandemic we're currently dealing with, you you all were living through another crisis. A tornado tore through your neighborhood last fall, devastating the area. So how are you? (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much for asking. Uh, We are we are doing great. Um, You know, I think between the tornado destroying our our home and the pandemic we are just so grateful for all of 
our friends and colleagues who have supported us and, and come to our aid. And during these times, I think like many uh our circumstances have, in a way, forced us to focus, uh, to reorder our priorities on mm-hmm. kind of where they should have been all along, on, on faith and on family and, and on friends. And so while these were challenging and remain challenging circumstances to go through, um, they have really, really helped us uh, develop gratitude. And we're just so grateful. We're grateful to have jobs that mm-hmm. allow us to work from from home, um, and we're we're grateful. Uh, you know, we can we can gather uh, as a family on Sunday and worship uh, remotely. So it's uh, no, no question. It's it's been a challenging year for us, but to the extent that it's really helped us refocus our priorities and appreciate what's truly truly important and lasting in our lives, uh, we're grateful for it. As you might imagine. Uh... October 20th, 2019, which is the day of the tornado, uh, sort of ranks in our family along with 9-11 as a day we will obviously never forget. So Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I was actually out doing errands when the tornado struck. Uh, It was a total surprise to all of us in Dallas because the weather reports had indicated that a storm was coming, but not until much later that night. So Allison actually had to manage both of our twins plus our two dogs all by herself as significant portions of our home were ravaged. And meanwhile, I'm struggling just to get home uh, through all the enormous debris. So Allison really was the the hero mom Mm. that night that she is every night. Mm. As for the pandemic, you know, like so many parents, Allison has become a champion homeschool teacher. She's just Honestly, she's just amazing to watch. You know, years before we met, she was a professor teaching English uh, literature to college students. Um, So you might say that our second graders are getting an amazing education from a former college (laughs) professor uh, while we wait for our school to reopen. That's really powerful. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. So now, before we dig into your careers, I'd like to start off, Judge, with your childhood. So you were born in Taiwan and your family came to the U.S. when you were a toddler. So do you think your experience as an immigrant shaped your future career in the law? So, yeah, I'm, uh, I guess I'm Taiwanese by birth and Texan by marriage. Um, but, you know, most importantly, I'm an American by choice, uh, the choice of my parents to come to America to find us a better life. And I think a huge part of why I so love being a lawyer uh, for most of my life and now a judge is really the same reason why I love being an American. You know, people all over the world want to come here. And uh, we should never forget why that is. Uh, people aren't desperate to come to America in droves because we're a failed nation. They're desperate to come to America because we're the most successful nation in human history. And I think that's because we're free. And we're free because we're governed by the oldest written national constitution in the world and that we take very seriously what it means to be governed by a written constitution. Mm-hmm. You know, one of my most treasured privileges, uh, being a new judge, is I get this amazing opportunity to preside over a naturalization ceremony. I do this every year in May. Uh, I guess I don't know if it'll happen this May, sadly. Uh, but every May otherwise is a sort of a kind of anniversary of my own naturalization, uh, which happened May 14th, 1982. And so every May I get to watch as this group of patriotic new citizens from literally all around the world, they swear an oath that they too promise to support and defend the constitution and laws of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that reminds me what it truly means to be an American. I mean, it means that truly anything is possible. Uh, a boy from Taiwan gets to represent Texas in courts like the fifth circuit and then gets to be a judge on that court. Uh, I mean, where else in the world does that stuff like stuff like that happen? It's just, uh, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be an American. Definitely. So now, if you hadn't become a lawyer, what do you think you'd be doing today? <laughs> well, you know, I've I got to be honest with you, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I, I co-founded my high school newspaper with a good friend of mine, and that was a big part of my growing up. In fact, I was actually planning to go to... Uh, Northwestern, uh, Medill School of Journalism there, uh, frankly, because I was told by my college counselor that uh, as an Asian American, I probably wouldn't get into Stanford. 
Um, so maybe I would have become a journalist um, because I do enjoy analyzing and, and, and writing about the great debates of our time. Mm-hmm. Now, Allison, I, as, as the judge mentioned, you, you used to be a, uh, a, an English professor. So I think we have a pretty good idea what you would be doing if you hadn't been a lawyer. So could you talk a little bit about how um, the path from getting a PhD in English and teaching, how that led you to the law? Uh, sure. And for me, law offered, law offered an opportunity to take what I loved most about being a a teacher and a member of the academy in terms of uh, loving loving words and language and thinking about uh, tough, important questions and to to take those skills and those abilities and kind of transfer it to an area that, in my mind at least, had more of a real-world impact. And the part, the part of teaching that I thought I was giving up, that I would miss the most, which was my interaction and mentoring the students that I was privileged to teach during those years, I served uh, as, as a professor. Um, I found uh, in law through the fantastic associates with whom I'm privileged to work, um, being able to serve as a mentor and sounding board to law students, to associates, uh, that that's enabled me to continue uh, one of the things I love most about being a college professor, which was being able to interact with and mentor my students. I've been able to continue to do that uh, in, in, in the law. And I guess what, what sort of triggered the, the change uh, was I'd come up to a point where I was going to be up for tenure soon and being faced with the, the prospect of, you know, literally spending your, spending your life doing something made me think, is this, is re- is this really what I'm, what I'm called, called to do uh, with my life? And at, at that same time, the college where I was teaching, um, I was on a faculty committee that was looking into some First Amendment uh, issues. And that just really intrigued me. And so law sort of presented itself as a way, again, to take what what I loved most and what I felt I had to offer in the academy and to fulfill my purpose and my calling by going in, in another direction. I actually had some of my students um, uh, tutored me in, in taking the LSAT. Uh, so that's sort of a, a, a table's turned. I, I think they, I benefit from it, but they, I think they enjoy the, that role reversal as well, too. Oh, that's great. So then you both went on to the University of Chicago for law school. Could you share how you met? <laughs> well, you may not realize it, uh, but you, you've actually asked us a disputed uh, question. Uh, so you may, you may need to get both of our, both of our, our, views, our views on this. Um, uh, the first time, uh, I, will say, I will say this, I'll be very lawyerly and precise with my language. Uh, the first time that we were actually in each other's presence was in the Green Lounge of the University of Chicago Law School when a member of my study group uh, was getting a hold of Jim's uh, argument outlines. Jim was a year ahead of, ahead of me in, in law school and, uh, you know, e- e- even then was renowned as someone that uh, others look to you for, for guidance and advice uh, and help in, in their path forward. Um, now, if you ask Jim, I think he will say that the first time we actually met was in a Federalist Society meeting where I stood <laughs> for election as the 1L representative. And one of the uh, questions I was asked, uh, it's sort of a, a, in true Chicago form, the election is a question and answer period where the candidates stand in the well of the classroom and field questions from those in attendance. And after that, a, a, vo- a vote is taken. And I was asked uh, to name as many current Federalist Society officers as I could. And uh, Jim, Jim at that point was, was, the, uh, was the treasurer. So I named him uh, among others and then spoke with him after the meeting. So I think if you ask Jim, he would say that was the first time that we met 
uh, I would say the first time we were in each other's presence was in the Green Mountains. So, Jim, I don't know if you want to uh, 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 tell your side of, of the story. or. <laughs> so uh, I've learned long ago not to contradict my wife. <laughs> <laughs> And certainly not on the record. Um, so I'm delighted that she made it very clear for the record. Um, the first time we actually talked to one another was at that uh, law school chapter event. Um, uh, she won the election and I met her right after. Uh, you know, the federal society, I like to joke, you know, it's obviously a debating society, not a dating society. Um, but for us, it turned out to be a little bit of both. <laughs> and uh, you might you might say that our children are are on this earth because of the, because of the federal society. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so then, after law school, you both clerked for Fifth Circuit judges, and then Allison, you clerked for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and Judge, you went on to clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas. So tell me about your clerkships. What stands out the most from those experiences? So the thing that stands out the most for me about my clerkship experiences is that it was during my clerkship uh, for Justice O'Connor that Jim and I got engaged. We got engaged the weekend between uh, Christmas and New Year's of my clerkship, and uh, because it was Christmas, the justice was in Arizona at that time. And so when she returned to the court uh, in January, uh, she, she, she let it be known uh, not too subtly that while she was very pleased that Jim had uh, spoken with my parents before he asked for my hand in marriage, that no one had talked to her about that. <laughs> so after this conversation, I got back to my desk and picked up the phone and called Jim. And I said, well, I, I think the justice was kidding, but I also think it would be a good idea if you paid a call on, on the justice in the very uh, near, near future. So the first thing that, that, that stands out to me about my clerkships is uh, becoming engaged uh, to Jim. This Second thing, if you'll allow me a second thing about my clerkship with Justice O'Connor, which was just an incredible honor and privilege, and I'm so grateful to the Justice for giving me that opportunity, was having the opportunity there to, to meet and to have the incredible honor and privilege of getting to know Justice Clarence Thomas, for, for whom uh, Jim clerked, um, getting, getting, getting the privilege and an opportunity of getting to know, to know him, um, to become part of, uh, you know, I guess Jim, Jim says he's, uh, what Taiwanese by birth and Texas by marriage. I sort of feel like I'm, you know, an, an O'Connor clerk, um, but also get to be, uh, a Thomas clerk through marriage in, in the same way. And so I guess it was those, those, those relationships, that's what, what really stands out to me about, about the clerkships. So I clerked for Justice Thomas, uh, I think, uh, three years after Allison clerked for Justice O'Connor. And I will tell you that my interview with Justice Thomas, I think we spent 75% of the time talking about Allison. <laughs> so my, my rule of thumb is if you want to get a Supreme Court clerkship, uh, marry Allison. <laughs> um, <laughs> Justice Thomas and Judge Smith uh, are actually quite similar, um, uh, at least in the ways that I most admire both of them. Uh, first, they hold these you know, positions of power and influence, and yet you can ta tell just from talking to either one of them that it is not about them. It is about the country. It is about the Constitution. They are both enormously passionate about safeguarding the Constitution and in engaging intellectually and honestly with the material and just let the chips fall where they may. And so I don't think you can clerk for those two judges and then become a, a, a judge or a, an attorney yourself and not be powerfully influenced uh, by the both of them. Uh, in addition, both of them care very deeply about their law clerk families. And so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's any wonder 
that they both have these amazing network of law clerks uh, making trouble all over the country. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, doesn't Justice Thomas have a former clerk on every circuit in the nation or something at this point? Uh, I mean, he certainly will soon at this rate. Um, and, and similarly, I believe that Judge Smith, uh, I think he has the most clerks who are now circuit judges of any active circuit judge in the nation. Uh, but I want to point out Senator Cotton uh, is another Judge Smith alum, and I, I know Judge Smith is you know, just another example, very proud of Senator Cotton and talks about him all the time. That's wonderful. And an interesting piece of trivia I'll have to run down to see if uh, Justice Thomas does, in fact, have a former clerk on on every circuit. So so then following your clerkships, Judge, you held a number of positions, including as the Solicitor General of Texas. Um, so tell me about, as SG, you had the opportunity, I think, to argue one case at the, at the U.S. Supreme Court. So what was that experience like, and what was it like appearing before your old boss? That was an unforgettable experience. Um, you know, it was also a peculiar one. I think it's the only time I've ever said anything during oral argument uh, as an advocate that generated any laughter, uh, whether I intended it or not. <laughs> um, it was also uh, extraordinarily surreal appearing before Justice Thomas. I mean, just as it's surreal serving on the Fifth Circuit with Judge Smith, for whom I clerked. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an added bonus. Uh, Justice Thomas actually wrote the six to two opinion uh, in favor of my client. Now, Allison, you worked for uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft. You worked as a policy advisor for President Bush and in private practice. And you've had the opportunity to argue four cases at the Supreme Court, including two that were just weeks apart. So tell me about that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, when I when I think about um, my legal career, you know, what stands out is just how privileged I've been to serve our country um, in, in small ways, but get a chance to uh, uh, work with just amazing, amazing people. Sometimes I kind of feel like, you know, the Forrest Gump of the, of the legal world. I've just, I've just had amazing opportunities uh, to get just little glimpses uh, into, into history and some of the great, the great people of, of history through the jobs that I've had. But, and I feel so blessed that I think that if you'd asked me the question, you know, what's your, what's your favorite job? I think at every point, um, in my life so far, I would, I would, it, the answer would be the job that I currently have. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the job that I do now. I, I love, um, uh, serving clients and helping clients with their, you know, most complicated, naughtiest problems. I love having just incredible colleagues that I'm privileged to work with day in and, and, and day out, um, and work on challenging, important, uh, matters. I mean, I think, I think back to this and that was actually my, those two arguments, it was my first argument and my second argument, <laughs> uh, that I, that I, that I did in, in those, those several weeks. And, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, when he was an advocate, he, he said that, uh, you know, there are three arguments. There's the argument that you, um, prepare, there's the argument you give, and then there's the argument you wish you'd given. <laughs> and I think one, uh, one uh, silver lining to, to having those two arguments so close together was I did, you know, I didn't have the, uh, the time or the luxury to sort of obsess over my first, my first spin at the podium. I just had to launch, uh, launch straight in to preparing for, for the next one. Um, and I've gotten, I, I think I've now, I've now had the, you know, Monday after Thanksgiving argument slot, uh, twice. Uh, it, and I, I, I was joking, uh, with one of the, the merits clerks when I was, was at the court about, you know, having that and kind of spending, having to spend Thanksgiving away from home and family, uh, for those two years, I said, like, "Well, you know, d don't get me wrong, because I know there are there are a lot of people who would trade places with me in a heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> uh, to have the the opportunity to argue uh, argue before the court, even if, even if it does mean giving up your uh, your time with your family, uh, especially at at Thanksgiving." So now I heard that you both argued cases before the Texas Supreme Court on the same day. I'm assuming you weren't up against each other, right? <laughs> 
No, no, we were we were not. And and in fact, that I believe that was the first time that we were kind of both physically present in a courtroom. We sort of make it made it a practice not not to uh, watch each other uh, argue. Um, <laughs> I, I I value Jim. I I value uh, I value his his thoughts and reactions um, more than more than anybody else in the world. And uh, so to to know that that he would be sitting there when, when I would argue, uh, I, I think would would uh, would make me more nervous than than anything else because he has just been. Uh, I just there are, there aren't words uh, for how supportive. Uh, Jim has been for me um, as a mentor, uh, as a friend, and and now as my husband. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm I'm really impressed by your research because I, <laughs> I had forgotten about that same day Texas Supreme Court arguments. Um, you know, it does make me wonder. Uh, we're blessed with you know many dear friends who have served on that court. I, I honestly wonder if one of the justices may have worried that. With our busy lives, maybe Allison and I don't get to spend enough time together. Uh, <laughs> perhaps a sad thing to say, but Allison's joked with me uh, that after so many years of marriage, that's what passes for a romantic vacation. <laughs> that's great. Well, speaking of arguments, Judge, I heard you concocted a plan to bring your kids to greet Allison at the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court after one of her arguments, but that someone almost blew the surprise. Tell me about that. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I guess it was uh, about five, six years ago, Allison had these back-to-back oral arguments before the Supreme Court, uh, and so she basically just moved to D.C. for about three weeks. Uh, but our twins were three years old at the time, and that's, that's obviously a long time without Mommy. Yeah. And so I told Allison, of course, I, wanna, I just want to bring the kids up to, D- to D.C. to see Mommy, uh, at least the day after her first argument, um, so that she could see him before we hunker down, before she hunkers down for the next one. What I didn't tell her was that we were going to arrive a day early, so that I could surprise her with twins on the steps of the United States Supreme Court just minutes after her argument. Now, as you might imagine, an operation like that takes quite a bit of planning. <laughs> uh, for example. <laughs> I had to conspire with her second chair to make absolutely certain that Allison would walk down the stairs in front of the court after the argument rather than one of the side exits. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I made sure we stayed at a hotel in Virginia, not D.C., because I didn't want to accidentally bump into her somehow. So the day comes. We land at Reagan Airport the day before that argument. You know, we're, we're walking through the terminal, and we bump into Ken Starr. And we have a nice but brief chat because I'm (laughs) – holding one of the twins in my arms. Uh, so I, and then I, and I, I take a few steps away, but then I start to ask myself, uh, I literally stopped walking for a second and asked, why is Ken Starr in D.C.? Now, this was back when he was president of Baylor. You know, could he be possibly going to the Supreme Court the next morning, maybe to swear in some Baylor alums as members of the Supreme Court bar? You know, what if he sees Allison in the courtroom? What if he tells her that he saw us at the airport? <laughs> All this is running through my mind, but I decide, you know what? I'm not going to walk back. I'm not going to stop him. I'm just going to keep going, and what will be will be. So as it turns out, Ken was in D.C. to go to the Supreme Court. He did see Allison, Uh-oh. and he did tell her that he saw us in town the day before. <laughs> um, but all's well, as I told Allison later, well, at least now I have something in common with Bill Clinton because we both tried to keep something hidden from our spouses. And in both cases, we were busted by Ken Starr. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you are all laughing right now. Allison did not think it was funny at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what a, what a wonderful surprise, though, to, you know, to have just completed your first Supreme Court argument and to walk out onto the steps uh, and, and to see, you know, your, um, your twins that you, you hadn't been with much uh, for, for probably weeks beforehand. So what a, what a wonderful uh, surprise. We have amazing pictures from that event, as you might imagine. 
Oh, I'll have to see if I can dig any of those up if they're publicly available. (laughs) (laughs) So speaking of the twins, how do you balance raising them with your, you know, high powered careers? So in my mind, Elizabeth, it's not really about balance, but about um, priorities. We love our family, you know, family, faith, of friends. Um, as we said, we both we're passionate about our jobs, um, uh, serving the country, serving our clients, um, and you know uh, we're both we're both big uh, big movie movie buffs. And uh, one of our one of our uh, favorites, uh, which might be a little surprising. Uh, is Fight Club, and there's a line. Uh, there's a line in Fight Club that talks about, uh, you know, no fear, no distractions, the ability to let that which is unimportant truly slide. And for me, that's that's the key. It's it's just focusing focusing on what's truly what's really important, and you know, your your faith, your family, your friends. Uh, serving clients, uh, serving the country, and uh, letting letting everything everything else everything that's truly unimportant uh, just slide. That's such great advice. All of that and very very careful scheduling <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of help, a lot of help, a lot of help. Mm-hmm. So shifting gears a bit, I've spoken with a lot of former law clerks about their experiences. And Judge, I'd love to hear from a judge's perspective, what lessons do you hope that your clerks will take away from their time with you? What I would say is don't be afraid. Stand up and fight for what you believe in. And don't be afraid to be criticized for expressing or doing what you think is right. And uh, I try to tell my clerks this. We, we have a lot of conversations about this. And I think it's true, frankly, no matter what you end up doing in your career, whether you do uh, devote yourself to the public sphere or you stay in private practice. Um, you know, so in the public sphere, it's easy to get caught up in you know, left versus right. And that's fine if you're in a policy or political branch, uh, which, which uh, some people go into uh, in the law. But if you're sticking to a legal role, I think it's absolutely poison. Uh, to get caught up in stuff like that, if your role is a legal one. Mm-hmm. I, I firmly believe that originalism is not conservative or liberal. It is simply being faithful to a legal text that you didn't write and that you have simply sworn an oath to faithfully construe. Uh, it's about asking the right questions, not predetermining what the answers must be uh, in order to be popular or respond to pressure. So if your role is a purely legal one, then you should just listen to everybody, make sure you've got the best arguments on all sides, and then reach your own best, good faith, intellectually honest conclusion, and just not worry about whether it'll be liked or disliked by one side of the debate or the other. Um, Because if you're about pleasing anybody in particular, then I think that's when you're getting into trouble. You're just not doing your job if if you're focused on who's going to like or dislike your conclusion. And I think that, that, by the way, the same goes for private practice too. Um, As I've told my clerks, you know, in private practice, everyone's generally obsessed with pleasing the client. Uh, But it's very easy to forget, uh, particularly in in big law, it's easy to forget who the client is because it's not in-house counsel. It's the entity that in-house counsel represents. You may not believe this, but two of my proudest moments in private practice uh, were when I decided to fire a client. in-house counsel wasn't taking my advice. And so the company I thought was just really just wasting its money. Uh, uh, And and people forget that attorneys are fiduciaries. We have an ethical duty uh, not to churn the bill. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I told the client, I didn't want to take their money um, because they're not, you know, in-house counsel isn't following it. So let's not do this. My firm supported my decision 100% each time uh, because honesty pays off at least in the long run. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think I, I think we got lucky because honesty actually paid off in the short run. In, in one of the cases, the company uh, eventually concluded that in-house counsel uh, was wrong and asked me to come back and ended up giving our firm actually tons more work after that. And in the, in the other case, I ended up getting hired by another company 
with fantastic in-house counsel to do exactly the same type of work on the same legal issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but short run or otherwise, in the long run, I think honesty and uh, fiduciary duty is what should govern anything we do, whether it's in private practice or in the public space. Honesty and, or and originalism. I think those are great guiding principles for, uh, for young attorneys just starting out. <laughs> Amen. So do you have anything in your chambers that reflects your personality or where you're from? <laughs> um, well, I'm blessed with amazing clerks and we have a fantastic, fantastic time together. And so, you know, yeah, I think it's deeply important to take the work seriously, but not to take ourselves seriously. And so my most treasured items are these amazing gifts that my ever so creative clerks have come up with. You know, one year I co-authored a dissent that was, uh, respectfully criticized by one of our colleagues. Uh, we were accused of being, if I remember correctly, something like we were accused of being pyromaniacs in a field of straw men. And so the clerks and I just thought that was hilarious. Uh, we took it very much in good stride. And uh, so we joked about it, but I thought that was, that was it. But uh, you know, not long after my clerks presented me with this set of playing cards with a hilarious image of a pyromaniac trying to light a bunch of straw men on fire. <laughs> um, uh, there's also a reference on these playing cards to the TV show Game of Thrones. Uh, but I think that's an inside joke that's probably too hard and frankly too nerdy to explain to your listeners. <laughs> um, another, another group of clerks gave, got me uh, custom poker chips to match the playing cards based on a descent that we worked on closely the next year. And so, you know, there, there, there's just so much that is serious about the law and it should be serious, but I think we need to take a step back from time to time and just enjoy each other as fellow human beings. Definitely. Well, one final question that I want to pose to, to, both, uh, to both of you, uh, something that I ask all guests at SCOTUS 101. If you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would you pick and what would you talk about? The justice I would pick would be Justice Thomas. Um, I, I recall during an interview uh, with him one time, someone asked him a similar question, um, said, you know, if you could have uh, dinner with, um, you could sit down with anybody throughout history, who, who would you want, who would it be? And without missing a beat, he said, my wife. And uh, I think that, that, that answer epitomizes for me, I just... A, a great, a great jurist, um, and just a singularly great um, person who, uh, you know, as much as as much as his jurisprudence means to the country, um, the achievement of his life and the kind of man that he is is just as, if not more important, a contribution to, uh, to, to our, our, our history. And so if you'll, if you'll, <laughs> if you'll permit me to put in uh, a, a plug, uh, PBS is going to be airing uh, just an incredible documentary on Justice Thomas, uh, mm -hmm. it's entitled uh, Clarence Thomas in his own words on, on May, on May 18th. Um, uh, Jim and I, uh, I think that was maybe one of the last films we saw in theaters, uh, before the, before the pandemic struck, uh, had, had, Jim and I had the opportunity to, to go and see that, that, uh, together. Um, and so I would, I would just, I would really encourage, encourage your listeners who haven't, who haven't seen it, um, to, to take the opportunity to, to watch that. Yeah. Definitely a, a great film, and I'm excited to, to see it again when it's run on PBS. Yes. All right, Judge, you're up. Justice Thomas, hands down. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, anybody who, you know, if you just have a conversation with him and hear his amazing, warm laugh, if, if you do not just, if that does not warm your heart, and soothe your soul, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, I've 
honestly believe, this is frankly years before I ever met him, let alone clerked for him, I just long believed that, but for people, frankly, you know, behaving politically or just, you know, obsessed with some case or the other case, if you just put that aside, he is unequivocally one of the most remarkable Americans alive. If you look at his history, his life, his childhood, what he has endured at every stage, he is yeah. an amazing story, an embodiment of the American dream. And watch that movie because it, it, <laughs> it, it, it tells you so much about this amazing person. So that, that's an easy, an easy answer. Definitely. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. This has been uh, such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It was, thank you. Uh, it was fun. Next up, we are going to do a final rendition of Supreme Court Trivia, where John Carlo and I try to stump Elizabeth Slattery in her, in her last episode uh, co-hosting this. And so I, I think we've got some good ones, Elizabeth. You, you ready? You ready for this? Yeah, I'm excited. All right. Question number one. In 1816, the Supreme Court decided the landmark case Martin v. Hunter's lessee. Which justice recused himself because he had been hired as Martin's original counsel in the case nearly 25 years earlier? Oh, I'm, I'm going to go with John Marshall. I don't know. It is. Elizabeth oh. is one for one. <laughs> To, it was Chief Justice John Marshall. One of Marshall's most significant clients in the years of his private practice was the estate of Lord Fairfax, who was his father's former employer. Fairfax had left his property to his nephew, Denny Martin, who retained John Marshall to defend his property rights in Virginia. Marshall uh, unfortunately lost his initial case in state court, uh, but the fight over this property would continue on in uh, multiple different strains of lawsuits uh, for another two decades, finally reaching the Supreme Court while Marshall presided over it. That's pretty incredible. I thought litigation lasted a long time nowadays, but 25 yeah. years? So that's just, like when uh, last in Kennedy's last year on the court, he he had to recuse um, after I, I guess his law clerks discovered that he had heard a case that was up at the Supreme Court when when he had been on the Ninth Circuit, which that had been you know more than more than thirty years earlier, and the case was still going on. This is trivia question number two. John Marshall was one of a number of justices who had distinguished careers in the military. Three justices, however, fought against the Union Army during the Civil War. Can you name at least two justices who were uh, Confederate soldiers before joining the bench? Oh, who were con Confederate soldiers before joining the bench? Um, oh man, my mind is, I'm going blank. I know there was, there was the one justice who left the Supreme Court to join the Union, or not to join the Union, to join the Confederacy, and then he later argued a case before the Supreme Court, although his name is escaping me. Um, but I, I, I don't know who were three. I don't even know who were two who fought <laughs> for the Confederacy. Well, we <laughs> Educate have, me. <laughs> we have Horace Lurton. Left his oh, of course, Horace Lurton. <laughs> Everybody knows him. <laughs> he was, in fact, captured by Union forces and escaped, only to be captured a second time. Uh, he often told friends later on that he was paroled by President Lincoln because of his mother's pleas for mercy, but historians have cast some doubt on that. The mm. next was Edward Douglas White. He uh, has many apocryphal accounts of his Confederate, Confederate service, but records confirm that he was a lieutenant in Barrow's 9th Louisiana Cavalry and was also captured wow. by Union forces. And last... Lucius Quincin, Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar the second. That's oh, right. My favorite. Hands down, <laughs> hands down, he uh, he is up there on the list of most awesome names for a Supreme Court justice. So Elizabeth, tell me why he's your favorite justice. 
No, he's my favorite uh, justice with an obscure name. Um, oh, okay, that's that's fair. I, would, I think the uh, Confederate soldier is your favorite justice is on, on shaky ground there. No, no, not my favorite. Just the my favorite of the most obscure. Uh, and I think his father, <laughs> Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar the first. I think he was a state Supreme Court justice, maybe Georgia. Uh, but I don't think he sat on the, the U.S. Supreme Court. I think just the, the son did. Well, you've stumped the trivia questioner. <laughs> Turning the tables back on you. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our third question. A total of seven justices fought during the Civil War, but one justice served the Union with particular distinction. Which would-be justice was wounded in three separate battles as an officer in the famed Harvard Regiment? Oh, gosh, I don't know. You guys are really into the Civil War trivia this week. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so they, I'll, I'll give you a hint. This this was um, uh, a, a very uh, famed justice. Uh, famed who, justice. Uh, th this is not an obscure justice. Okay. Let me think. Who? So he would have been appointed after the Civil War, um, and he was... Hmm. One last hint. It was called yes. the Harvard Regiment because so many of its men, including this one, attended or graduated from Harvard. Well, I mean, saying a Supreme Court justice went to Harvard is, you know, that's like more than half of the justices in history. <laughs> hey, that's half, half of them fewer that you've got to guess. <laughs> I don't know. E educate me. I don't know this one. So this was Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Oh. He enlisted during his senior year of college. He was commissioned as a first lieutenant in the 20th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Again, uh, nicknamed the Harvard Regiment because so many of uh, of the men uh, attended and graduated. Um, so he man, was. Man, yeah, yeah, I he, have heard that before. Man, it just you know I didn't I didn't remember. He was he he was uh, served with distinction. Was wounded three times at the Battle of Balls Bluff at Antietam and Chancellorsville. So some of the the bloodiest battles of the war. And he served out his entire three year enlistment before retiring as a brevet colonel in 1864. We have one, one final question. And that for was you. just the start of an illustrious career. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it actually went uphill from there. Um, so yeah. we final question for you. There are okay. things included in this one. John Carlo, I turn it over to you. All right. A final future justice avoided Civil War service by hiring a substitute to fight in his place. Who was that? <laughs> Another Civil War? Come on, guys. That's right. We're going for <laughs> themes here. I'll give, I'll give you two hints. This okay. justice would go on to offer author over 450 uh, majority opinions, one of which was the infamous case, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, who wrote Plessy versus Ferguson? Um, oh, I don't, I'm thinking. That should be the giveaway for me. Um, I know Harlan dissented. So somebody who authored more than 400 opinions. So he must have been on the court for a pretty long time. Um, hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know the answer. You guys right. are really sending me off on a, a high note. <laughs> <laughs> it was Henry Billings Brown. He would have Henry been, Billings Brown. Okay. He would have been the eighth justice to fight in the Civil War, but he hired a substitute instead, which was a common practice among wealthy men at the time. The Enrollment Act of 1863 provided that a draftee could pay a substitute sum of three hundred dollars, which today is about ten thousand dollars, to enlist someone right. in his place. I mean, that must have been nice for him. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, those were hard. And uh, I think you identified a blind spot in my my knowledge of of the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know much about the this, this civil who fought in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> you did so well last week. This is actually a testament to how well you did that we had to go start finding obscure Civil War justice trivia to try to get you. 
Well, when you guys, you know, when you mentioned that the theme was going to have something to do with military service, I was hoping, you know, maybe something would come up about, um, you know, I think Justice John Paul Stevens might have been the the last um, the last justice who served in uh, who served in a war. Uh, he fought in, in World War Two. So I was I was hoping for some questions. Well, you already knew lines. the answer to that one. That wouldn't have been any yeah. fun at all. <laughs> Exactly. You would have stumped us again. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, this is your last episode, and we are very sad to see you go. But we want to thank you for all the time and hard work you have put into this program and made it what it is. Yes, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. If if there is anything that that John Carlo and I have learned over the last couple of weeks, it is that you have clearly put in uh, just an incredible amount of time and and effort, um, and, and have done a phenomenal job. Uh, building up this podcast and we we certainly have some uh, huge shoes to fill um, but we are incredibly grateful for for all of the the time and energy you've you've put into into this podcast and, and into this transition well thank you and you know of course thank you to the listeners for being a fantastic audience and tuning in every episode to hear what i have to say about the court and i'm excited uh to see the two of you take take the helm and, and see what you do with the podcast, um, in the future. So I'm, I'm excited for the next chapter for myself and for, uh, for you all in the podcast. Well, thanks for listening to SCOTUS 101. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts and please leave us a five-star rating. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS 101 and email us at SCOTUS 101 at heritage.org with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Elizabeth Slattery. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, and Mark Guiney. For more information, visit heritage.org.